Howdy, everybody. Today is Tuesday, February 28th, 2023. The time is 5.30 p.m. We're here for the regular session of the Coppell City Council. We do have a quorum present, so I'm calling the meeting to order. We're going to be convening into executive session of the first floor conference room. At the end of the executive session, I'll come back out and announce that we're entering into work session, at which time the public will be invited to join us. Thank you very much. Howdy, everybody. The time is 6.20 p.m. We have adjourned from executive session. We're going to be entering into work session in the first floor conference room. And the public is invited to join us. And I apologize that we took so long. I was not expecting that. So we'll see you in the conference room. Good afternoon, everybody. This is work session for the Coppell City Council. The time is 23 p.m. Uh, we've got three items on the agenda. The first one is a discussion regarding the agenda. Anybody have any agenda items that you'd like to ask about or discuss? I do have John questions. Um, agenda item C. Is it we or what? Part three. Tweet. 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 Okay. I have a few questions about that one. I know we talked about this before, but I <coughs> want to get some clarification on this. Um, <clears throat> so it talks about 
414,000, and then obviously the history about things that happened and we did not go forward and so on, so on, so on. Of the 250,000, or 414,000, 250,000 is coming from these, the CRDC, and then 164 is from the debt funds. How do we decide what percentage of that comes from what? Well, the, the original project uh, was originally going to be funded from CRDC through the park because it was a park project. And, we, and, and when we got in there, we realized there were some additional drainage needs to be added to that project for that project to be fully functioned. And so uh, we added some additional storm drain work. And so the storm drain work is what's coming from, mainly coming from the Dud Fund. And so the parks portion of the project, the pond, is what's coming from the CRDC fund. Okay, because I was looking at the bid. And then I guess the bid, the erosion control, is talking about 11,210. And then I thought, what other portion justifies bringing that much from the debt fund today? So that, that's what I was trying yeah, to figure out. Right. The original, the original budget was from CRDC, I believe, was, was the 250 number. And what happened was when we went out to bid, the numbers were a lot higher, as, as you can see. And so to offset some of those costs, knowing that we had additional drainage work that really wasn't originally included in the project, and so the DUD fund would offset that cost to be able to fund the project because we added that additional uh, 42 inch pipe. And so is there a, a threshold percentage where we could just take from that fund on a project like this? Because I think the DUD fund, is, there's a specific use, right? Yeah, but th so there's, there's, there's additional <coughs> portions of that project off the, could be dud fund related. Um, the, the, ero the erosion and the storm drain pipe. Um, there was the additional pipe that was added and the outfall structure that in, that's in the creek and then the, the pond inlet structure that's in the actual pond. <coughs> really, uh, any of that, anything storm water, storm water related could be coming from the dud fund. Okay. So, theoretically, we could have funded more of the fund from that fund than the, what were being was being used at this point. Is that a fair thing to say? In other words, it could have been more than one hundred sixty-four thousand from the debt fund. I, I'm just We're trying to see what the yeah, correct possibly, but I, I, I believe the intent was it was originally funded through CRDC, and so that was the reason because they budgeted. It was originally budgeted through CRDC. Uh, yeah, originally. Okay, that's, that's the question. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Any other questions? Thank you, Mike. Pichu? Um, on number D, um, $65,000 for the consulting fee, um, what is the end result that we are looking for? Um, uh, is it a one time charge? It's going to have a follow-up charge after that report is submitted, uh, further studies or anything like that? The uh, study, it's a one-time, to my knowledge, unless the foundation <coughs> comes out and hires the votes to do additional work, that's on the foundation. So there's no additional work from <coughs> our perspective. Uh, as far as the production, um, Part of the scope is to take a look at the scheduling and the fees related to the resident companies as it relate to the art center. And then there's the um, portion that's going towards helping identify the resident companies and their needs, how they can work with the foundation, how the foundation can work with the art center, how they can raise funds to support the resident companies that then in turn supports the art center. So that's the big picture but there's a lot of little pieces underneath that. So we are trying to maximize the revenue. The objective is to eventually get there, yes. It won't. There, this plan is also gonna lay out a strategy for time as well. Right. Okay, thank you. Okay, sure. <laughs> this is Kevin. And this was from our, our last meetings, and essentially they're creating a playbook for the art center is what my takeaway was. It's, it's a playbook for the resident companies, for the foundation yes. that then supports the art center and how that relates. That was the objective. Just there, there's, the, there's the playbook so we, that they can follow. Like that kind of helped me understand what the purpose of that was. So Yeah, I see helps. the service agreement, 24 pages. Um, it's long. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody have anything else?
right, moving on to item B, uh, receive a legislative update from uh, Ms. Rodriguez. All right, y'all. Hey there. Good evening. Good evening and welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen here. <clears throat> okay. Um, yeah. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Thank y'all for inviting me to visit with y'all this evening. Is my volume okay on my side? Yes. yes. Okay, We're good. Great. Great, great. Well, I'm going to just give y'all um, a, a legislative update since we visited in December, and so you'll you'll see it's kind of similar format to what I presented whenever I was there in December with John Kroll, and just give you a kind of update to where we are and then the outlook for the next few months. We are entering the third month tomorrow, and um, there's 89 days left, but who's counting, right? Um, everybody <laughs> in Austin is counting. And so you may recall this slide from before. It's really just the the major dates of interest. There's a lot more um, on my end that we're following and monitoring, but for most purposes, here they are, right? The legislature convened January 10th. Uh, a week later, we have the inauguration of the governor and lieutenant governor. They are both uh, now entering their third four-year terms. And then a month later, the governor had his biennial State of the State address. And this was unique in that it was held um, in prime time, if you will. It was held on a Thursday evening at a location, a private business in San Marcos. And that's different. Usually it is a joint session of the House and Senate. But as we all learned, that's not a requirement. Um, I think everybody thought it was up until now. Um, and then he, had, he made some announcements. I'll go over here in, in another slide. Um, and then March 10th, that is a week from Friday. That is our bill filing deadline. But uh, as you may recall, bills have been uh, introduced since November 14th. And so everybody is looking forward to um, March 10th, um, which is also, that coincides with the 60th day of the legislative session. And I think I emphasized this before, that's, that's a key date. Under the Constitution, our legislature is not allowed to take up bills for consideration on the House or Senate floor until after that 60th date, uh, with the exception of emergencies as designated by the governor. And so, um, the first 60 days, and you may have read some about this in the paper, there's been some um, irritation by some members in the House that they don't go ahead and move things along a little quicker, but, but by Constitution, they really can't do anything without suspending a lot of rules. Um, and then we have the, the, the final two dates there. May 29th is a Monday, Memorial Day, signy die, the last day of the regular session with emphasis on regular. Uh, hopefully you don't see any special sessions. And then um, the veto deadline, which is also the deadline to sign bills by the governor, also the deadline to uh, allow bills to or, or legislation to become law without signature, that is June 18th, which is a Sunday and Father's Day. Uh, typically, Governor Abbott has released this, uh, his, his vetoes a few days in advance so he can spend his Father's Day with his family and, and members can as well. Um, legislative leadership, again, uh, as we know, no changes uh, in the House and Senate. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Patrick is there for his third term. Dave Phelan was overwhelmingly reelected as Speaker of the House on opening day. He did have an unsuccessful challenge by uh, Representative Tony Tenderholt of Arlington. Uh, after a lot of speeches, which is, is part of that process, um, uh, Representative Tenderholt ended up with three votes passed for, his, um, for him. And then uh, since that time, you know, both bodies have kind of settled into a routine of convening on Tuesdays and Wednesdays of each week. And uh, again, it goes back to they really can't do anything until after that 60th day. So if, you, if you're visiting the Capitol right now um, on a Tuesday or Wednesday, they do convene on the floor, but they're doing things like recognitions of, of different folks who are visiting the Capitol or they're passing resolutions that are, are really um, just honorary and ceremonial for the most part. But we do expect, we're hearing that the House will start convening on Mondays next week. And so that seems pretty typical with this time of session. Um, committees are starting to form and, and, and get organized. So things are picking up. It, it definitely feels like the pace of the legislature has shifted here in the last um, five or six days. Committee assignments. Um, 
it, you know, it's a little easier for the Senate to take care of this because the Lieutenant Governor is dealing with only 31 people as to the <coughs> that the Speaker has. And so it's no surprise that the Lieutenant Governor made his assignments um, with his, really with six new members is what he was placing um, the week after the inauguration. And so immediately the Senate committees on redistricting and finance, which are both led by Senator Joan Huffman out of Houston, they met uh, redistricting, uh, took care of their business over like a three or four day period. And, and just a quick reminder on that, the purpose of the redistricting is really to, to make sure that they cross their T and dot their I, if you will, uh, because the Constitution says they have to take care of redistricting in the first regular session uh, after the census numbers are released. So you may recall that in 2021, those numbers did not come until well after the regular session. So nothing's really uh, different about this. It could be, but as far as we can tell, nothing looks different. No lines are, are gonna change. Um, and then the, the Finance Committee, they have brought in the, in the Senate, they have brought all of the state agencies before the entire Finance Committee. This is where they lay out their budget requests. They receive feedback from all the different agencies. And then now they are in their working groups. So the Senate Finance Committee, which is the largest committee um, in the Senate, they they are appointed to different working groups and then they take a deeper dive into the specific agencies that they are assigned and then most of the other senate committees are are now conducting their um, organizational hearings two committees heard a few bills this week um, the one that we most closely watch you know, they're all important right but the one we most closely watch for uh, city is the local government and that's chaired by senator paul benport out of houston and um, it's the one that filters the largest portion of bills that impact municipalities. That North Texas is overwhelmingly represented here. Uh, Senators Springer, Hall, Parker, Paxton, and West all serve on that committee. And, and by far, that region has the most representation on that committee. And then meanwhile, Speaker Phelan, he uh, made his assignments February 8th. And to be honest, it was later than I think a lot of people thought. Um, we did have you know another weather event in there, but last session he got those out February 1st so um, like the Senate the Appropriations Committee was the very first one to to organize and start their process because per the Constitution that is the only bill they have to pass right we have to have a budget in place to take over September 1st whenever the current one expires and so um, those sub subcommittees are also meeting they meet early mornings every day and then the other committees have also started uh, organizing a couple of bills were heard uh, this week there's one tomorrow with a, a preemption bill um, House Bill 92 if you want to look later but I know I've, sh I've shared it with staff there and, and there's some things in there that um, that cities won't like but it will be heard tomorrow in the agriculture and livestock committee so I will, will continue to monitor that along with all the other cities and, and municipal and county government in the state um, <coughs> There's just the numbers where they are yesterday, and I gotta be honest, I didn't even look today, but as we approach that March 10th deadline, it's getting upwards of like 200 bills a day are being filed. So it's gonna take a few days to climb out from under all this, but you can see we have, as of yesterday, they, they passed the 4,000th bill filed mark, and um, we're on pace, or, or they are on pace to exceed that number of 6,900 there were a little more than that filed last session. So it looks like there's going to be a lot of bills filed here in the next eight days. Those are business days. They are not open to file on the um, Saturday or Sunday this weekend, but they probably will extend the hour on Friday the 10th. And this is a, um, it is a deadline, but I will say, in case y'all are like, well, what was Jennifer telling me? There's a deadline of the bills introduced. There are ways to introduce bills after that deadline and it inevitably happens. It's most usually done in the Senate. It requires uh, a special vote uh, to introduce legislation after that bill filing deadline. And it's more common also for local bills, like truly local bills, um, affecting just a, a certain portion of the state through through the different ways they, they write those up. So um, we, will, we will see a lot of activity between now and uh, March 10th, and besides signing die, that's probably the date that most people around the Capitol look forward to more than any other. <clears throat> 
So you, there, here are some of the issues, and, and really I didn't change up anything from whenever I saw y'all in December because everything's broad. I mean, again, they're going to file over 7,000 bills, and there's going to be 1,000 reach the governor. We're going to see a lot of legislation, right? But, but these issues here represent what we see a lot of, or we've seen a lot of lawmakers and the leadership uh, emphasize over and over in their visits with the press and, and things that they've released personally. I did up that budget surplus number. In December, when John and I were um, with y'all, it was 27 million, I'm sorry, billion. And now, of course, the $32 billion. Um, well, and, and there have been bills filed on each of these items here, uh, lots of bills actually. So that will, that will continue. Um, let me make sure I didn't miss something. Oh, I know, I'm sorry y'all. Um, okay, so the Lieutenant Governor has come out with a list of 30 priorities that he released a couple weeks ago. And I think what, what we'll note here is that he, he issued these priorities and assigned them each bill number. So the easy one is SB1 is the budget, right? And we already knew that. But he assigned them um, issues, but only two of the bills, including the budget, have been filed. The, uh, the other one is SB2 is a voter fraud bill, and that was actually heard in Senate State Affairs today. So all the other bills uh, in his list of 30 have not actually yet been filed. Uh, I expect that will take place soon. The Lieutenant Governor has been out last week and this week, and, and finally his office made a statement that he is dealing with a, a dental issue and a, and a personal matter, and so he's expected to back, be back um, any day in the Senate, and I think that we will see more of those priorities released by him. And then meanwhile, over in the House, the, the Speaker did not do anything like that, but he has come out on two separate occasions, including today, and has released what now we could call eight of the priorities, again, with the first one being the budget. Uh, the other <clears throat> budget, sorry, the other bills that he has announced as priorities and have actually been filed are uh, a consumer data privacy proposal. Uh, this, this is by your neighbor up there in South Lake, Representative uh, Capriglione. Uh, extension of Medicaid eligibility to 12 months postpartum and um, a social media protection for minors bill and then a sales tax exemption bill for family care items. And of all the tens and tens and tens of sales tax exemption bills filed, this is the one that even before the uh, speaker made it a priority, this is the one that most people believe will have the most traction during session. It's got wide um, bipartisan support. Uh, and then today, the speaker announced three more priorities. House Bill 5 is the Texas Jobs and Security Act, and this is the House response to the expiration of Chapter 313 that, um, that phased out in December of 2022. And so it's going to create, it's a revamped version, and I'm sure the language will, will continue to change, but it's a revamped version of Chapter 313, which is an economic development tool for, for businesses. Um, in Texas. And then the other two that were announced today were um, a community college funding proposal and then a House Bill 19, which establishes a business court system in Texas. And so, meanwhile, the governor, he hasn't had a priority list, anything like this, but what he did reveal, which I think we're all identifying as his priorities now, were seven emergency items in his state of the state. And uh, those were items like you know, property tax relief, ending COVID-19 restrictions, school choice, school safety, bail policies, border security, and fentanyl. And so, although these were designated emergency items and that allows the legislature to bypass that 60 day, um, the 60th day that I mentioned, it's really not time for that now. I mean, they, they're, they're really, that's not an effective part. So I think what we can take is that those are his priorities. Um, and you know he's been going around the state just this week talking about the um, education savings accounts, the school choice issue, and um, and lots of members have filed bills along the lines of his emergency items, but but neither the House or Senate are are moving forward with those. And then um, just to update, we talked about this in December too. This is the the bill that we are directly advocating for um, on behalf of Cop Hill, the Street Maintenance and Repair Sales Tax Bill. It has been filed now in both bodies. Um, Representative Julie Johnson filed it early, early on, the, the first couple days of, of the bill filing in November. 
and then Senator Johnson filed the companion, and Senator Parker signed on as a, a joint author uh, over in the Senate. So the, the House version goes the Ways and Means, and I should mention, um, you know, in, in the House, we have lots of committees we follow as well, but specifically for Coppell, we've had a lot of activity in Ways and Means. That chairman remains uh, Morgan Meyer out of Dallas, and then the House Calendars Committee, which is where this bill, once it advances from Ways and Means, would go to calendars. It remains chaired by um, Representative Dustin Burroughs out of Lubbock. And so um, Ways and Means in the House and then local government in the Senate. I met with Representative Johnson and her uh, chief of staff yesterday because they are, are getting prepared to submit the bill request and that's the next step. They have to ask the Ways and Means Committee to chairman to set the bill for hearing. And as soon as that is done and we're notified, of course, I'll notify y'all because we will need someone from the city to come up and, and be a, a resource and testify um, in support of the bill. And I, and I do know that um, I suspect a lot of y'all's conversations when you're here this week that, that that may be part of it. And so I thank you in advance for that. Um, I look forward to seeing y'all this week. I'm, I'm excited. I know some of y'all are traveling over tomorrow evening and we'll be here Thursday. I, your timing is good because things are really buzzing over there and I think that by the end of Thursday y'all will hopefully have come away with a good visit and some good feedback from your legislators and the other folks that you visit with. So I'm going to pause and, and seek your feedback or any questions I can address. Well thank you very much. Um, you actually answered the only question I was going to ask and that I was going to ask if you had a, any insight into the total number of bills that were going to be filed. So you, you did a good job on that one. Uh, anybody have a question or comments for, for Jennifer? Looking forward to your demo. Thanks. Well, y'all wear comfortable shoes on. <laughs> y'all got a busy agenda, I saw, so. Yeah, it's very, yeah. it's very full. Um, Appreciate, appreciate the time, and uh, we'll see you Thursday morning. All right. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Item C is a task force from the Ford Board uh, regarding the village concept. Miss Mindy, we're actually very eager to hear this. Yes. Well, good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you for letting us be here tonight. Um, so tonight I do have the pleasure to introduce Peggy Quinn to you. She is the chair of the Ford Task Force, and she'll be presenting the group's research on the village concept to you tonight. Um, but before I turn it over to her, I just wanted to make a few comments. So first, I wanted to ask all the Ford Task Force members in attendance to raise their hand. Um, I just wanted to recognize this team and acknowledge all the work the group has done to pull together this information you requested after the village concept was first introduced to you in January 2022. So they have worked hard to create the framework for a business plan that could be later used to implement a village in Capel. <clears throat> all financials are rough estimates based on the research they've done thus far, but these estimates are just that. Their estimates that are subject to change if City Council wants to move forward with this idea. So tonight, staff needs direction on how you want to proceed. If you're interested in pursuing the concept further, <clears throat> we need direction from you to proceed with the development of an implementation plan that will use Ford's research as a framework and guide to make the Coppell Village, um, a village concept a reality in Coppell. So with that, I'll in, um, let Peggy Quinn come up and present to y'all their findings. <coughs> Thanks, Nadine. <coughs> Welcome. Hi, thank you. I'm Peggy Quinn, and y'all have already met some of my board members here. And um, so we're going to get right to it. i this precious. So back in January, um, Y'all were introduced to the idea of a Coppell Village, which is basically a 55-plus village that's kind of uh, made by the city's uh, the, the city area, and then anybody who's 55 could become a member of the village. So um, we were asked to come up with a theoretical Coppell plan if we were to have a city-funded 
and city supported Coppell Village, what would that look like? So we went and we did some um, focus groups with citizens to get their input. We joined the Village to Village Network, which is an organization that has um, a toolkit if you want to make one. There are over 250 villages out in the United States, and so they have the best practices and stuff all wrapped up in their toolkit. So we joined that. And so we had that to guide us. We had focus groups with citizens to, to uh, go over villages that were in existence and what they have so we could get some public input. Um, we then um, we took a look of what if the city of Coppell launched a 55-plus um, village um, with, with the city being funding it and supporting it. So we took a look at what's needed time-wise, personnel-wise, funding. We did this by researching the best practices of other villages. We talked to them in-state and out-of-state, as well as the documentation that they have at the Village to Village Network. Um, so you have a basically a, a five-chapter, um, 22-page booklet of what all we found and what all we constructed of a theoretical what if we did this here. And so I'm going to go over the overview. Basically with the last census, you know roughly about 25% of Coppell is 55 plus. Every household, um, home, apartment, townhouse, etc., if they were 55 and they had one person who's 55, they could join and they'd be eligible to join the village. Um, the proposed pricing in the business plan is uh, roughly $60 per household. And we say roughly because depending upon the village formation, it could go up or down depending upon what um, services and the service levels. In some of the villages, there are services that are promised to uh, the people, so they pay more because they know that once a month they're going to get something. So, um, so for the purposes of a village, you can think of it more as an organization. It is not a physical place. So the gatherings may or may not involve city spaces. The gatherings can involve event centers um, or members' homes, restaurants, parks, local churches, you know, all sorts of places. So a village coordinator would be needed to kind of... Um, so that um, they could intertwine city services with also with charitable um, uh, groups that have something to offer the village and community-based organizations. And so the coordinator would intertwine all of the different offerings with the village. And there would also be three steering committees that would be steering um, the village from creation to everyday organization and everyday um, expansion or any type of editing of services, anything like that, with that coordinator. So there would be 6 to 12 people on those three committees. So um, every village member is generally active with a committee when they join the village. And that keeps the village viable. It keeps the village uh, basically servicing its own members with what they need. So we looked at Beacon Hill. Beacon Hill is, is in Boston. It's outside of Boston. It is the oldest and most successful village in the United States. It is run by three basic committees, the Membership Recruitment and Engagement Committee, the Program Committee, and the Service Committee. So when we looked at the different, um, the different services to make up a village here in Coppell, we, we wanted to go ahead and structure it like um, Beacon Hill, since they were so successful. So basically, the city departments would be involved. Of course, the city of Coppell would need space for the coordinator and phone numbers, the normal you know, um, office supplies and stuff. The police department may or may not be involved um, for friendly checks. Um, some villages don't use their police department, their, their police departments or their, um, uh, their volunteers within the police department. 
Um, but for the fraud advocacy program, um, whenever there's identity fraud involved, uh, the police are involved with you. It's just an extra um, little help if you were a village member, if the committee decided to go that way. Allies in the community, um, of course, they structure a lot of volunteers and things for around the city. The community-based organizations, we have had participation and talks with them. They do want to help and support in some way. Um, so we'd be looking at them for some technical assistance, advocacy programs, and life-changing assistance. So the foundation needed then for this would also entail a database. It would have to be a very robust database and application to track everything and then statistically report on everything so that your um, village would keep current and, um, and, and keep organized. Um, there'd be documentations for you know village charter process and procedures so that we could promote continuity and consistency throughout the years. Um, there'd be automatic report designs so that there would be a monitoring of who's using what and when and, um, and what's going on. And then there's training for volunteers or even uh, volunteers for different services. And then marketing materials um, would have to be ready and we would use the city's marketing avenues for that. So overall we felt like but the actual launching it, the prep for launching it would take six, nine to 12 months. So the offering would be, um, and these are offerings from uh, Fort Bend Village, which is outside of Houston, because they mostly mirror kind of what we have here in Coppell. Um, so they have a vetted list of business and providers for people to age in place in their homes. They have advocacy help and assistance for various things like identity theft, Medicare, and insurance assistance, one-off projects um, uh, for people who are trying to age in place with their homes, transportation options, and technical assistance for smartphones, tablets, things like that. Then they have uh, friendly check-ins. They do both phone and in person, but again, <coughs> the committee would be uh, looking at that. And then social and educational events with affinity groups and field trips and um, the village program committee would take care of that. An affinity group, just so we're all clear, so as a member you would say what your interests are. And let's say that there was a group that are interested in photography. They would have an affinity group and once a, once a month or so they'd go out and take pictures. You know, they, they'd use their photography skills as a group much like a 55 plus active adult community that could exist if there was land. So the milestones uh, prior to launch, like we said, would be a coordinator. It would be um, the village database, um, of course an office and phone numbers. The vetted vendor list would have to be completed. The training completed for everything that you were going to offer at the get-go from friendly checks. Um, and all the community-based organizations would be ready for anything that they were going to offer. And then technical assistance program as well as the volunteer systems, uh, volunteer systems in place for operation. As far as day-to-day -day man uh, management and organization, of course the Coppell um, village coordinator would be working with the three uh, membership steering committee <coughs> Um, on, you know, on processes and procedures, on the service, um, the service calls and the financial focus of the group. Um, the committees would be looking and reviewing all the activities and the usage and the development and which ones needed to be changed or um, anything needed to be added or deleted if there was no usage and they would assist in organizing the affinity groups, the field trips, and the events, and align everything with marketing and written communication that could be disseminated through all of the avenues that Coppell already has. They would also be tracking the finances with the village coordinator. So here's what it looks like from a picture standpoint. So you have your village coordinator, you have your three committees. 
Here's what it looks like for the three committees as they work with community-based organizations mm -hmm. and volunteers and, um, and you know, uh, everybody who wants to uh, help with the programming. So again, we, it's going to be about 9 to 12 months for the organizational timeline. Um, and of course, City uh, Enterprise Solutions Department would need to work on the database and the application needed. The coordinator would start off by putting together the three committees, and then the village body would then start, um, you know, constructing the village and all the pieces needed in order to launch it. Um, we were suggesting a soft launch um, so that all these systems could be checked, the database could be checked off a soft launch and stuff, and then once that's done, a full launch. As far as the marketing, the, uh, the committees would write their own marketing materials as they were planning the different services and events that they were putting together. They would use all of the City of Coppell uh, communication avenues, like we said, the water bill, Coppell happening, you know, the social media, um, any of the publications here. In addition to that, they would take advantage of all the charity uh, based or the community based um, organizations that would be part of the village in their newsletters and in their uh, written materials. So now for the finances on this. So this is theoretically what we put together based on the amount of homes that have the 65 plus tax exemption, we figured 25, we figured 250 homes would be the start of the village. And every year it would grow by 25%. Um, we figured a 3% uh, increase in goods and services and the village to village membership would always remain constant so that we could keep up with all the trends and updates and things going on around the country. Um, and, uh, and continue to make our village viable. So the Coppell Village Database and Application, um, we didn't have a way of actually fine-tuning the money there. So what we did was the helpfulvillage.com is an application that a lot of villages use to keep track of their <coughs> membership and their, um, and their volunteers and everything that they're doing. So we met with them. And so the pricing on the application and stuff comes from them. So basically with the revenue at 250 homes, you're looking at 12.5 for the first year. And then of course we have the growth for the next five years up there. The actual out of, out of budget money um, for this of course would be the salary and the benefits for the coordinator as well as a computer for the coordinator and things like that. Um, the software uh, and database would be expensive at first, for the first year is more expensive because after that you're running the database with just upgrades and so you're not having to start up a program from nothing to something. And then um, last but not least, a third party background check vendor would, need, would be needed and so we put some money in for that. Some volunteers would have to go through background checks, some would not, and they're identified in your packet in the business plan as to who goes through background and who doesn't. The, um, then there is a cost. This is the city expansion cost, if you think of it that way. Different departments that would have to, you know, the marketing department would have to do more pamphlets that would include the, um, the, the village. So this is kind of an incremental expansion of what Coppell already has, and that's going to be about $7,500 is what we figured. Um, so, and for example, in the police there, they already do the reports with a person for identity theft, but if they needed to help them to do the Federal Trade Commission part of identity theft, they would be doing that, so that would be incremental. So with all of it together, you're looking at about $120,000. And then the 12.5 coming in from the residents would <coughs> offset the addition from the actual city departments. And then there'd be some left over uh, for the projected P&L expenses. 
we know that it's not going to be totally covered, but um, it would be, you know, partial. So now I'll take questions on any of this, and then I've got one other thing uh, before I step down. Thank you very much. Council? Kevin. Wow. Uh, <laughs> just take a moment there to exhale after all that. That is uh, incredibly detailed. Uh, thank you for that, uh, number one. Um, I get my, my initial thought is that um, <coughs> I know that we have, like, in our senior community center, we have, you know, like you were talking about, like, you know, potential field trips and, you know, like, things like that. Um, yeah. Understanding that this is a framework, have you gotten to the level where, we're starting to look at maybe what Coppell already offers and how that integrates into the um, into the village model yet. We did know what Coppell offers. There were a couple of us on the uh, on the board that are also members of the Coppell Senior <coughs> Center. Um, it's a totally different concept, though. Like, for example, an affinity group that wants to go see museums and once a month they plan museums and they just get together, park their cars decide who's going to drive and then go off and do it. It's a totally different it's a totally different concept than what we have. It's 55 active adults. So some of these people are probably members of the core maybe. They're still exercising at the core. Um, it's a total different type of of, of animal um, than what is serviced totally at the at the senior center. For example, another one would be bridge. It would be more apt on these affinity groups to have the same uh, four or four <coughs> people playing bridge every week. And they found each other through the, the 55 plus community that would be created. It's a little bit different. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we're still digesting. Um, yeah. Yes, no, no, <laughs> but we didn't, uh, yeah. John? Sorry. Well, thank you for the presentation. You talked about, I guess, the 55, I guess you kind of have the idea of what, the, that's about 25% you talked about, right? Do we, did, were you able to uh, get a, do a survey or type to see their interest in this kind of concept? Yes, we held four focus groups, um, two by, via Zoom so that anybody could uh, attend even if they weren't traveling. Um, and then two live at the senior center, and uh, we did, and we presented them with what various villages were doing in Austin, uh, the one Fort Bend outside of Houston, um, and then the Woodlands outside of Houston, and then Beacon Hill and Boston, and so uh, we presented all of that to them, and then they told us what things they liked and didn't like for what's going on there, and uh, most of them said that 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 would be a really welcomed concept. It but would be a welcomed maybe you know, thing here. But. I'm talking about the city of Capel, mm -hmm. the residents. You and then you got to get feedback. What we what are we talking about? Like in numbers? Do we have any numbers? The the live ones we had over 70 people. I think. Okay. Yeah, I, um, we had uh, note takers from the from my board. So each each focus group we had at least three people on there. We can't have four because that's a quorum. But we had three <laughs> on each uh, on each one. And so yeah, at the, at the senior center, the live audiences, it was about 70 each time. And then, um, or 70 and, yeah. And then on the phone, uh, it was probably about 35 to, to 40 people. It was several pages on Zoom. And just to kind of get I mean, trying to understand a little better. You talked about $60 per year membership per, I guess, household. Um, and then you talked about num you would have, I guess, list of contractors, for a, so to say. So are they giving them a discounted price? Or what, what if, what's going to happen if they use those lists? Some of the vendors in some of the villages do give a 5% or 10% discount if it's a village member using their services. So the goal would be for the committee that's putting that together to talk to them about that. Um, the goal of the actual vendors list is that these are vendors that have been vetted so you know that you can trust them to get bids. Um, and then, um, uh, and, and of course, 
the um, uh, any vendor that is like a handyman or something like that, that's what we built in there for the background check. Um, if they're not a bonded company. Okay, but bonded they're not a set company. percentage discount because they are part of that list or anything like that? Not yet. Well, they, the, they would be negotiating for that. Okay. Now, whether or not they could find that, whether or not, you know, the plumber on the list would say, yeah, I'll do it or not. I mean, you still need to have a plumber <clears throat> on the list. So the committee would be trying that. And in most of the villages, there are discounts for, for each different type of, of service. Okay. And then the, you talked about, I think, the, the wellness checkup, things like that. Um, mm -hmm. Have you talked with the uh, cops, the citizens on patrol? Because I know they do a lot of that for the police department. That is what I talked to. I talked to Kelly. Okay. Yeah, I talked to and um, yeah, that's who I talked to was, was Kelly, and so she's aware that that in in Fort Bend it is their citizen patrol that does the one-on-one -on -one with monthly visits. They also have a group of volunteers that do phone calls. So you have uh, a you have phone calls and visits, and they're also trained when they go to visit to talk to the individual and um, to see if they are, maybe they have been scammed and they just haven't recognized the fact or whatever. So they're, tra they're trained in that. And we did talk to Kelly about that because she would have to train, um, train the office and the, um, the volunteers to, to question them in that type of manner or in a manner of what's going on so that they could report back. Is it fair to say almost like you know, you commercially here for good, contract, good contractors list? It's almost like that where you are, except for backup of ten thousand right? dollars. Yeah, I think the background checks. I don't think the good contractors list to quite do that. And what the fear would be would be a one-on-one -on -one situation with an air conditioning guy that you know maybe isn't being fair to them or whatever, and. Um, you know, so you, you would want to make sure that everybody's kind of on the up and up that's on the list and, um, you know, in, in working with them. All right, thank you. Don? I think it's a great idea just from all the concepts we've had um, for our senior community. This one is great uh, partially because the dollar amount is probably more moderate compared to some other things that we could do. and. It connects the community as much as anything, especially that the, the older the older community that may probably oftentimes gets isolated. Or so I think it is great from that standpoint. When you've talked to Fort Bend or Beacon Hill or any any of the others, from a sustainability standpoint, uh, had, had the programs been going on for a number of years in these other locations? I mean that that would always be one of my concerns is whether it's with the coordinator that the city has or other people involved. You know, as people churn and move and whatnot the ability for the program to <coughs> remain robust and sustainable is always would always be a concern. So is, is there any perspective or feedback on that from these other places? All of them, or most of them, said volunteers are constant churn. Yeah. And so they said volunteers are constant churn. Um, as far as the programs, you know, if the program's not being used, if for some reason you don't have, you know, anybody who wants a wellness check, well then you don't need the program. You know, so it's an ebb and flow type of thing. Mm -hmm. And things like when the pandemic hit, Austin, uh, Austin has a village too, they told me that, they're, that they had a need for people's service dogs to be taken to the vet, that people could not get out and drop off their dogs and stuff. So it's an ebb and flow thing. You know, something happens and the village responds. Um, there was also a study in Beacon Hill used the study that found that um, hearing loss um, actually increased with the pandemic because people were not engaged with other people. They were all in their houses. And so they put together a program and as the pandemic lifted, they started going out to museums and started going out on a weekly basis to things movies, museums, all sorts of things, 
to get uh, people back engaged in the community um, and to make the, um, the hearing loss um, go back. So, yeah. Uh, another, another quick question. Uh, I guess this may be getting too much in the weeds at this point, but like the, the, the contractor list, let's just take that for example, uh, or an advisor list or anything else, there would be some kind of vetting process set up, set up ahead of time, right, where anyone could come in and if they hit all the qualifications, they would be on the approved list. Is that right? And pass the background check or whatever the other criteria is, or has there even been much thought? And where I'm going a little bit is, is there any kind of legal liability with having an approved <coughs> list of contractors, you know, that the city puts out there or anything. disclaimer in there, the quality of the service is the issue, it's the safety and availability and price. Okay. I just want to, I guess if we had a good vetted process, I guess we would be covered. I just the process sure. for vetting that mm -hmm. we've taken from some of the other villages is in your packet. Um, basically, um, Fort Bend, for example, goes to their uh, their Chamber of Commerce and they find them. When I looked at our Chamber of Commerce list, quite frankly, we have no plumbers. Mm -hmm. So in that respect, we do have some plumbers that are here in Coppell and what would happen is um, in, the, in your document it says that we would look at their reviews on Yelp and Google. If they don't have a four or better, then we just have to keep looking. Um, it would be it would be best if there was two to three in every category, like construction or any or any of them. But if there can't be, there can't be. Okay. Thanks. Peggy, Peggy, and the board. Thank you for your time. We do appreciate it. Great <coughs> presentation. Can you could you please go back to the Fort Bend um, slide, please? Fort Bend slide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a list of services that list. <coughs> yes, the Fort Bend. <coughs> List of service. <coughs> there we go. So yeah. this would be the initial offering, um, the four bullet points offering, yes. How much are they charging for their members? Uh, I would have to look at my notes to tell you the truth. Um, I can't remember if they're the ones that are free or if it's a different one. Um, the, there's one that's $75, there's another one that's $600 a year of, of all the ones that we looked at, but like I said, they're guaranteed services. They get four rides a month. They get something. How um, many members are there? Oh, there are 75 members of the, of the Fort Bend, I do know that. 75 households? Yes. On the Beacon Hill in Boston, how many members? Two thousand and something. And do you know how much they charge? They uh, they charge a lot more. Yeah, they do. Um, and they have a sliding scale like Austin does of income compared to what you would pay. So they're a sliding scale just like Austin is. <coughs> and the coordinator that you mentioned, are you recommending as a city staff? Yes. Okay. Is it full-time or part-time? Full-time is what we have put in the plan um, because at first the setup and everything for the 9 to 12 months setup is going to be, you know, quite something. You know, that you would have 12 people per each committee that's actually forming it, but for example, just like Don said, for disclaimer, that city staff person would be going to, to Bob and saying, what, what do you want this to say? We need a disclaimer. Thank you. I was intrigued by the description of the, uh, the wellness check. It's not just a health check. It's much more expanded than that. That's correct. It's all the well-being. For example, um, in Fort Bend, he said a lot of times they'll go and talk to somebody and they'll find out that their spouse has passed away. <coughs> and so then there are services that can help them to deal with that. Like, you know, even Metrocrest here in our neck of the woods 
has uh, services to deal with that too. So it's about learning that and then turning it in to the, the uh, coordinator and the committee and then um, reaching out to, or even that person being trained to say, here's some, something I can help you, you know, here's, here's some avenues for help. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, we've been waiting since February of 2022, <laughs> yeah. and you know, this is good stuff. So, Mindy, you were looking for a direction from us. I got. I have one question. When would our, if we said go today, when would we start being, or when would we start incurring cost on this? <coughs> We've included a position in the five-year forecast for next year's budget. Um, we would want to get someone on staff to start helping doing some of the implementation plan. Um, but again, as great as nine to 12 months sounds for implementation, I can't guarantee that it could be that quick. Um, so we, I think we would start with the employee and start getting the, it, everything together to get really started to go live with it so but that, that but that wouldn't be till next year that would be in next year's budget that's we proposed that in next year's budget yeah. uh, actually kevin, kevin had before you kevin i was just that did you have a second part of your presentation that you had mentioned or as a follow-up or something we just have a follow-up to this so whatever y'all decide if you decide <coughs> this is a good fit or it's not a good fit it's not appropriate or whatever we're doing a housing survey and we're using the same uh, third-party vendor that y'all used for your for the city used to be the <coughs> satisfaction survey we're using the same one and on there there is a section where it asks questions specific to a village, a Coppell village. So if y'all can give Mindy guidance later on before we launch our survey in April, we're going to launch late May or April, um, then we can scrap that part of the survey if it's not a good fit because we don't want to ask citizens about something if we already know that we're not going to do it. John? I have a couple of follow-up questions. Um, you talked about one, was it Austin, that was 75 members, and then it was, Fort Bend was like 2,000, you said? Or, Beacon Hill or, or Beacon in Hill. Austin Beacon Hill. is okay. the largest, and that, that's because they've also taken in other communities. They started out small, and then when they had the good formula, all the rounding towns said, hey, can you start including me? Do you know what the cost, the expense is on both places? We did get, I got the um, actual annual um, cost on the Woodlands, and I did pull down Beacon Hills, yes, because they, they publish it. So I do have those. Would you, you yeah. want me to send those to I, you? I would like to see that. Okay, so Beacon Hill and Beacon Hill and Woodlands. Uh-huh. Mark? Um, Mindy, where will we fund this from? We, we have not, I mean, right now it's just in the general fund budget. General fund? Forecast, but I think of where a good slot would be, there's something appropriate. Don? Is it, is it a spot that rolls up to you or would it in one of your departments or do you know yet? We don't know that yet. That would be all part of the implementation plan. What yeah. kind of? <clears throat> Can you know all the facts right now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Council, are we okay with them proceeding with the plan? Don? So uh, my comment is I love the plan because, like I said, it's like the, I, I see it as another version of the tool sh shed or the Coppell Connected. I mean, it's all this stuff to build community. So I love the concept. Part of my reservation at this point is, how deep you get into, like, especially with another FTE, having to put on another FTE, uh, like, at, at what point, and maybe you can't, maybe there's, maybe you can't do it with, you can't ramp it up without the FTE. I just hate to get too deep, not knowing exactly how much, how many people would subscribe, would, would to buy into it uh, and be involved. Uh, so that's a little bit part of my concerns at this point. If you're asking for direction about whether to move forward, 
are we saying implement the plan as presented or staff just go and formulate a more detailed plan I guess what's what, which which is, which is it? it if you gave us direction tonight it would be included in the 23 24 work plan okay which y'all would eventually potentially adopt if you included it in the language then from the adoption of the work plan the budget gets built to support the implementation of we do not have the capacity to do this okay whether it was in Mindy's shop or Jessica's shop <clears throat> so if you have a desire to move in this direction it's going to take some manpower it's going to take an expense and that's you know if that's what you're going to struggle with I'm telling you up front it's going to cost money yeah no and I, I don't have an issue with that by itself I just want to make sure it's approved <laughs> yeah. it, it well, ends up being a very but there's another side of this though I mean you saw her numbers it's not going to be a profit center oh yeah I'm not, it's yeah. going to be so it's going to be something that you're going to be funding you're going to be supporting <clears throat> to what degree mm -hmm. they gave you an example they you know did phenomenal research on it but we haven't applied any pencil to this right no that and that makes sense all community amenities are not right. self-funding right so uh, that's not the issue as much as just making sure we're going to get you know it'd be great to get 250 homes buying in but and it sounds like I don't know why there wouldn't be material buy-in but those are my concerns I guess is what I was so to, playing out to her this. next question though in the survey if they're putting it out in April I'm not putting words in your mouth Peggy mm -hmm. but you could ask the question if a village concept was implemented and it was costing you $60 a year it doesn't commit you but you could at least get its feedback in terms of hey I like the concept uh, and you know $60 a year $100 a year I, I don't you know in terms of what value does it have to you right. right you can ask that kind of question you can style that in that kind of question that extrapolates that information before we spend a dime yeah and then to your point you've got some feedback and you know it shoot X amount of homes do it and it's let's say there's 75 homes that do it you still have does that matter and I don't mean that coldly I just mean it's 75 houses versus 250 houses what uh, for I'm telling you Sugarland and Fort Bend is much larger than Coppell Texas <coughs> and, and so to have only 75 houses there's still value for those 75 residents <coughs> in the village concept and probably from a momentum standpoint as it grows it'll get bigger so this is I think it'd be great if you had 250 to start off. I don't know that you'd have 250 to start off because nobody really understands what it is yet. Right. 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 I can definitely see the value there. It's uh, probably just about of what to take to, to to stand it up, and I would love to hear everyone else's. <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't you just look at me? I don't. Like that? I, no reason. <laughs> but I'd love to hear other thoughts. No, it's just just like what you mentioned, what Mike had kind of wrapped it all together, and, I, and that's my concern too, right? I mean, seventy-five housing, two hundred fifty. Of course, the more the, the more the better, but it will be a commitment of the, the expenses that you saw. Um, I, I know we all want to help senior citizens and, and even the community. I, in fact, I even talked about. Uh, I think Louis. I I talked about. Wouldn't it be nice to have a list of people that are you know, good contractor or good that provide good service, right? Or or even at least the bad ones, right? So you, you could avoid them. Um, or a disclaimer. Yeah, because some sometimes you can't get the contractors for sure, but you want to, you just want to make sure you don't you avoid the others, right? So, but it goes back to the cost and really what I mean. If we're serving twenty five and we're spending that kind of money, then I. I I really would. I would love to have the program, but I would have to think about that and make sure that we are using the money and spending it wisely. Um, sure, we want to provide as much as we can for our seniors, but at the same time, we also have to think about where the tax dollar goes. But this is a way to provide for the seniors. Sure. And the, I keep coming back that we tasked the Ford Board with coming up with innovative solutions to the housing and even though this isn't directly addressing housing this is addressing a part of that housing 
So I got to congratulate them for, for thinking out of the, this is, this is way out of the box I was thinking in, and I got to congratulate them for doing that. Oh, for sure. For sure, we, I think we mentioned even many times that, you know, you guys went beyond what we had initially thought about, but um, and it's all appreciative. But at the same time, we do have to think about, again, ultimately the cost and, you know, are we servicing 25 people or, I mean, what, what is it? That's, that's the concern. And like you talked about, we, we invest so much into it, I mean, we want to make sure we're, we're doing good for the whole community. <coughs> <That's a> question. <coughs> so obviously that initial target is 250. What would you, do you even have a, an answer to, the, to a question of like, what would you consider to be successful? If you had 25 homes, would you consider that successful? Would that be not worth it? Or do you have, do you have any thoughts on like, Maybe even communities that implemented this and it didn't launch well or anything. Any thoughts to that? Um, we could talk to some of the same communities to ask them how hard it was for them to launch. Um, and many of them may have taken more than one year, to mm -hmm. be quite honest, to launch. No, 25 homes would probably not be, you know, a I wouldn't be launching balloons and saying, we did it. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but, I mean, it's a start while people figure out the concept. We have a lot of people that think that the village is, you know, is going to be a kissing tree outside of, of San Marcos, or it's going to, you know, it's a tangible place. It's a 55 plus place. And uh, this is not. This just kind of fell into our lap as we were researching 55 plus places, mm -hmm. quite frankly. And it just, <clears throat> we, we then were introduced to this concept. We had never heard of it before. I, I guess I would say I would be very interested to see the results of your survey uh, that is done to see what kind of appetite it, it would be done. I think that would help me make a, make a very clear decision on that, I think. <clears throat> the yeah. survey that we're doing in April. Right? Yeah, and, and also, I know you're going to come back with us with the, uh, the I guess, the cost of the city for that 75 and 250. And how long have, has that gone on? I mean, do, what changes have they seen last two years, three or five years since, their, the, since the inception of that you know, program? I'd like, to see, I'd like to kind of see that. The change in the budget, so I can contact them and see if they can yeah, give me. Yeah, change in the budget and then also, I guess, the membership as well, um, how the concept went. So I, go ahead. So, expanding upon uh, Kevin's um, idea about the survey, I mean, you, you were targeting an absolute number of 2,500 homes here in Coppell because we, we know they're 65 and over according to the uh, tax exemption. Can we serve them, I mean, and, and get a genuine interest from those people? Uh, that would be... Matt does our crunching. Yeah, that's somebody else. That's a question that I'll have to tap into our um, system to see if we can extrapolate. I'm sure there is a way to do it. I just don't know if we can do it just right off the hand or if we have to write a program to do it. Keep in mind, it's not just a 65. This goes down no, to we, we won't know yeah, any right. We won't know any. There's, there's legal issues <coughs> that have to be vetted. Right. Because that information is protected. <coughs> survey goes out, then you may not know who fits in because that information is protected to protect the seniors. And the, and the official is pretty jealous of that information by right. sharing it. So right. It's kind of, it's confidential. Sure. So it may be hard. So no, we can't do that. Well, we could. Uh, there may be a way to do it, but because there's some other things that we could attempt yeah. to do, but we've got to be careful about that. <coughs> In the survey, we're asking age categories. So guys, we're out. We're past 7.30 right now. 
Um, I, John? No, I, I, I didn't see more. In well, order to, yeah. all they're asking for is to is to move forward to give you the data that you're yeah, asking I mean, for. Yes. Right. Yes. 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 We want. I want more data. Okay. So. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> all right. I like the idea. Yeah. yeah. I think I just well, that people can use it. Okay, the time is 7.33. We're adjourned from uh, work session. We'll be reconvening at uh, City Council in seven minutes. So, you know, the, the 250 is 10% is of, of the 65 population.
guess we'll do the business of the city. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, or evening by now. It's 7.41 p.m. We're moving into the regular session of the Coppell City Council. As a reminder, any persons wishing to speak during our citizens' appearance must sign the appropriate register outside the council chambers and list your residence address. Item number four is our invocation, which will be given by Reverend Beth Kellner of the First United Methodist Church. After that, we will recite the Pledge of Allegiance, so please remain standing. Reverend Kellner. Loving God, gracious God, we come, we come before you this night so full of gratitude. Gratitude for the blessings of the day. Gratitude that we are able to gather this evening, to gather freely. Gratitude that we can, we, we have an opportunity to speak, to lift our voices. We give you thanks for all of these, all of these wonderful blessings. We give thanks for this, this council that serves this community and is continuing to seek ways to make this, this community truly our home. We ask your blessings upon them this evening, your blessings upon the decisions that they will make, and may it all be done, may it all be done to glorify you and to truly, truly enhance our lives in this world. Amen. Item number six is our citizen's appearance. Any persons wishing to speak must sign the register and list your residence address. Presentations by individuals shall be limited to two minutes each, and individual speakers' time may be extended for an additional two minutes with the approval of the majority of the council members present. Persons signed up to speak will be called in the order that they signed up. No personal attacks by any speaker shall be made against any member of the council, the mayor, individual, group, or corporation. There will be no comments or deliberation from the City Council due to the Texas Open Meetings Act. Once our timer si sounds at two minutes, the City Secretary will cut in and break and make the request to the Mayor and Council if the speaker's time can be extended an additional two minutes. Tonight we have one person signed up to speak and that's Ms. Barbara Bailey. Just, and as a FYI, Ms. Bailey, I know that you've, come on down. <laughs> I know that you've spoken to several of us and we are still waiting to hear back from our consultant and we'll have uh, someone be back in touch with you at that point. But uh, please come forward, state your name and address, please. Barbara Bailey, 232 Plantation. And um, my neighbor sent me this and asked me to read it to you. It's an email to me and it says, I'm glad you reminded me about the new sidewalk transitions after your fall. Yeah, I fell down finally in the dark. Um, and I am glad you are an advocate for so many of us who raise their, their psalms and wonder why we have these lousy, hard-to-see new bumps to deal with. As an, ad, as an avid former plantation sidewalk user, I would like to put in writing that I am very frustrated and angry with the new sidewalk curb transitions. I ride my bike almost every day on the Capel streets, and my wife and insurance prefer I ride on the sidewalks out of the line of cars. Since the construction is completed, I no longer ride the sidewalks on my home street or plantation because they are too dangerous even for an avid biker. The bumps, or whatever they are called, are extremely dangerous and completely random at each transition. I fail to see the reasoning behind why these were made so awkwardly and for what benefit. They seem to serve no purpose other than a hazard for anyone on wheels or feet. I hope this helps, but knowing the city and how much they probably spent on this awkward design will probably fall on deaf ears. Jay Dugan, my neighbor. Okay. I have turned in so much information about how all these other municipalities and states consider them hazardous. And one of the problems I'm having, and I'll try to be real quick because I have 42 seconds left. Um, when I uh, spoke with your new assistant city manager about the petition we turned in with signatures, some of which had, I mean, my dis disabled people in there, um, and I asked him why that 
everyone's opinion didn't matter. And he said, we care about all the people. So if the taxpayers and the residents and some of those who are disabled are not part of all the people, then the city employees are not being responsive. And we just want ADA compliant sidewalks that are safe for pedestrians and bikes in the day, in the night, when the leaves fall, when there's mud, when it's raining, that's all we want. Thank you, and I've got stuff to turn in. Thank you for your comments tonight, and yes, please give those to Sarah. Thank you very much. All right, item number seven is our consent agenda. The, the consent agenda is routine in nature and, and is generally enacted in one motion. These items have been previously approved through the budget, our past council actions, and any item may be pulled and considered separately. Full descriptions are available on the screen. Council, is there any discussion asked for or to pull an item for consideration? Seeing none, I will, cons I will entertain a motion. Council Member Hill. Uh, yes, I'd like to make a motion to approve con consent agenda items 7A through D. Seconded by Councilmember Long. All in favor? Long, Carol Nevels, Jen Matthew Hill. All in favor, none opposed. The motion carries. Thank you very much. Item number eight is uh, consider acceptance of the annual comprehensive annual fund for the fiscal year ending September 30th, 2022. Ms. Tien. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you for having us this evening. Um, tonight, John DeBurros, the partner with Weaver, is here to present the results of the fiscal year September 30th of 2022 audit. Um, before I have uh, Mr. DeBurros come up um, to the mic, I would like to point out um, Vanessa Tarver is our financial engagement group manager, and she is the one that led the audit. So she coordinated with the auditors, and it is her responsibility and she did a, an outstanding job and I just wanted to recognize her because I really appreciate her work um, and her dedication to the city. And now I'll turn it over to John. Thank you, Kim, and uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor and me members of the council. Uh, I'd like to also take an opportunity to thank uh, Kim, Vanessa, and the rest of the finance department for all their hard work in preparing for the audit and making it very successful, as you'll hear. And um, again, my name is John DeBurro. I'm an audit partner with Weaver, and I want to present to you the results of the fiscal year 2022 audit. I have a presentation that goes through uh, a number of things, um, audit results, the audit process, uh, our required communications, and financial highlights. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, I'd like to begin with the, the good news, our audit results. We've issued three reports in association with our audit this year. Uh, the first of which is our independent auditor's report on the city's financial statements. And we've issued an unmodified or clean opinion on the financial statements, which means that we feel that the financial statements are fairly presented in all material respects in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. We've also issued our independent auditor's report on internal control over financial reporting and on compliance and other matters, and have a report that there were no significant deficiencies, uh, no material weaknesses. And the final report that we've issued is our independent auditor's report on compliance for each major program and our report on internal control over compliance in accordance with the uniform guidance. And this is the report on the city's uh, federal financial assistance program. Uh, which was the uh, ARPA program this year. And we issued an unmodified opinion or a clean opinion that means that we feel that the city complied in all material respects with all the compliance requirements for that uh, major program. And there were no findings. So it was a very successful audit. And in our audit process, uh, just to give you a little bit of background, we started our audit last summer, uh, planning for the audit and performing a risk assessment. We actually began our interim field work last August where we uh, look at internal controls and we, uh, over the significant accounting transaction cycles like payroll and cash disbursements, and we identify the controls 
Uh, we found no weaknesses in internal control, and then we actually walked through transactions to make sure that those controls are in place and operating as designed. Uh, we came back in, in January to perform the majority of our field work, uh, which I'll elaborate on in just a minute. We had our exit conference uh, last week and issued our, uh, our opinions on the financial statements on Friday and released our reports. We perform our audit in accordance with generally accepted auditing standards, uh, generally accepted government auditing standards, and the uniform guidance for the single audit. And we utilize a risk-based approach, uh, which means we, we can't look at every single transaction of the city, so we uh, tailor some of our resources to look at things of, of higher risk, such as revenue recognition, uh, various liabilities, and uh, expenditures of federal and state awards. Um, I mentioned that we came out and performed interim field work in August. This just lists out some of the areas that we concentrated on at that point in time. And in January, again, I mentioned that we performed the majority of our field work. We also identified the, the one federal program that had to be audited this year, which is the American Rescue Plan Act. And um, we also uh, used a variety of techniques in testing the, the city's balances and activity for the year. The next section of slides goes through our required communications, and I won't go through all of, uh, all of these. They're here for, uh, for your reading pleasure, but just to kind of uh, talk in summary, they go through our responsibilities under the different auditing standards uh, that we're charged with expressing an opinion on your financial statements based on our audit procedures, and I mentioned that we issued an unmodified opinion on the financials. Uh, with regards to government auditing standards, we also have to issue a written report on the internal control of financial reporting and compliance. And our responsibilities under uh, uniform guidance are similar, but we're responsible for expressing an opinion on your compliance with uh, the major federal program. Uh, in the area of unusual transactions and adoption of new accounting principles, uh, the city did implement one new accounting principle this year, and that's uh, entitled GASB uh, Statement 87, the lease standard, and it required the city to report leases for the first time on the financial statements, uh, reporting leases receivable. Um, uh, there were no evidence of any material errors, uh, irregularities, I already mentioned no material weaknesses. There were really no difficulties in uh, performing our audit, uh, no disagreements on application of any accounting standards. And I'm happy to report that there were no audit adjustments required uh, to uh, conduct our audit as a result of our auditing procedures. So good news all the way around. Um, I like being the bearer of good news. And <clears throat> I have a few hi financial highlights slides I'd like to share with you, and these numbers are derived from both this year's and last year's reports. Uh, the first two slides go through the, uh, the city's general fund revenues, which totaled $82.7 million this year. That was a $2.6 million increase over the previous year, and it was really the net effect of a few things, the, the largest uh, being a $4.5 million increase in taxes and franchise fees, and a $3.4 million decrease in intergovernmental revenue because of uh, the end of the CARES and SAFER grant programs. And you can see that in detail here, the uh, property taxes increasing uh, by uh, just under a million dollars, sales and mixed beverage taxes increasing by 3.4 million, and intergovernmental revenues decreasing by 3.4 million. And the next two slides give similar uh, comparisons of the general fund expenditures, which totaled $55 million this past year, which was a $1.4 million decrease from the previous year. You had uh, a couple of areas that decreased more than others. General government expenditures decreased by 1.3 million. Capital outlay decreased by 1 million. And again, you can see that here on side-by-side -side comparisons of the functional expenditures. General government decreasing from 12.3 million to 11, while um, capital outlay decreased from $1.4 million to approximately 400,000 this past year. The city's general fund fund balance was $133.2 million as of September 30th, and uh, the general fund fund balance increased by $24.6 million this year, and it really was the combination of um, 
of increased revenues combining with decreased expenditures. And when we look at the general fund, which is the city's main operating fund, um, we have a general fund budget versus actual comparison in the act for, and overall there was a favorable budgetary variance this year of $12.5 million. And the majority of that was, was looked at in two different areas. Overall revenues were $4.3 million uh, over budget, while expenditures were $6.4 million below budget. And finally, with the city's water and sewer fund, there was a uh, $3.7 million increase in net position this year. And uh, looking at what caused that, operating revenues uh, were increased uh, from the previous year by $1.9 million, and that was generally due to increased consumption due to the unusually hot and dry summer. And net non-operating expenses decreased by $1.5 million, uh, primarily due to a, a prior year loss on sales capital assets. And uh, GASB uh, is continuing to be busy and has more uh, pronouncements uh, for new accounting changes, which uh, we'll make sure that we uh, speak with the, the finance department and make sure that they're adequately uh, versed in, in the coming changes to implement them properly. And that, in a nutshell, is my presentation. Again, um, kudos to the, the finance department on another great audit. And I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you for your presentation and your time tonight. You heard the bearer of good news, so thank you very much. It, it, Council, it's any much, any much better being in the bearer of good news. <laughs> <laughs> any questions? Council Member John. Thank you, Mayor. You, during your presentation, I think it might have been the second slide, you had said there are no, you don't have, well, there are no significant deficiency to report. So, but there are significant, or there are some deficiency. No, there were no, no, no that, those are what are classified that we, we have to report if there are any, any significant deficiencies or any material okay. weaknesses. Okay, and, and just want to clarify that. <laughs> okay. yeah, Thank there you. were no, no uh, control deficiencies that were uh, either significant deficiencies or material weaknesses. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I gotta admit, I was a little worried on the, the one on the water fund until I realized that the uh, increase in expense was just due to the weather, so not much yeah. we can do about that. Yeah. So. <laughs> thank you very much, appreciate your, your time tonight, and you're welcome to come back with news like this anytime. <laughs> we will. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Oh, it just it says acceptance. I'm, I stand corrected. We need a motion to consider acceptance of item number eight. Council Member Nevels. Thank you, Mayor. I move uh, to. Uh, Consider acceptance of agenda <laughs> item eight. Yeah, let, I move to accept it. Seconded by Council Member Carroll. All in favor? Long Carroll Nevels, John Matthew Hill. All in favor, none opposed. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you again. Item number 10 is city manager report, uh, project updates, and future agendas. Uh, thank you, Mayor. With the, the weather we've been having, we continue to pour concrete on South Beltline. I know everybody's excited about that. Uh, the Moore Road Boardwalk project is underway. A uh, portion of the trail between Andy Brown East Pond and Moore Road Pond is currently closed for site prep. Um, you'll notice tomorrow that they will, go, they will begin dewatering the pond and relocating fish from the Moore Road Pond. So, the Moore Road Pond. <laughs> That's it, Mayor. Item number 10 is Mayor and Council Reports. This is reports by the Mayor and City Council on recent and upcoming events. Uh, please join the Coppell Police Department for coffee and conversation from 8.30 to 10.30 on Saturday, March 4th, 1st, 4th, I'm sorry, March 4th, at Ecclesia Bakery and Brunch, 804 South MacArthur Boulevard. And then later that day, also Saturday, March 4th, from 2 to 3 p.m. at the Cosby Library, Join Jerry Harwell of Republic Services as she provides 
answers and discusses the most recent news of the industry. Uh, come with all your recycling questions. And then the Theater Coppell presents The Odd Couple, March 3 through 5 at the Wheelis Wilson Jr. Theater. Tickets are on sale now through the website. And we are calling all brave heroes to come enter into a magical world of myths and legends in the fantastical new and interactive show for the family called Dragons and Mythical Beasts at the main hall at the Coppell Art Show uh, starting March 4th. Tickets are on sale now. Item number 11 is council reports concerning items of community involvement with no council action or deliberation permitted. Item number A is a report on the Dallas Regional Mobility Coalition. Council member Don Carroll. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the last quarter it's been relatively uneventful because in December we didn't meet for the holidays. In February we had an ice storm, so we didn't have as much. In January we did meet and we covered basically a detailed break briefing on the legislation of interest to the uh, mobility coalition that was going to be coming up this spring, uh, as well as we what sort of uh, our advisor what what we were to expect out of the legislative session this year. I will say later this week um, we're, we are having a meeting for March, uh, and Congressman Colin Allred from the 32nd District will be uh, on tap, so we'll get to discuss with him the infrastructure bill that has recently come out. So that will be interesting. There are just three quick highlights I want to point out that I think are very interesting from a transportation standpoint. So if you look at the population in Texas, 80% of the population live in 12 counties out of the 254 counties. Um, and, 90, uh, and about 1,100 people are moving to Texas every day. Of those 1,100 people that are moving to Texas, 90% of them are moving to those 12 counties. So you can see over time what that's going to do from a mobility and transportation standpoint in those particular 12 counties. Uh, one of the other things that will probably come out in this year's legislation Legislative session will be addressing paper license tags as that has become quite an issue from a safety issue for law enforcement and then there's also tends to be a correlation between the paper plates and criminal activity that's going on. Uh, there's also an economic issue with lost tolls on some of our tollways and things like that. So that will likely be addressed. And then the last thing is high speed rail comes up from time to time, especially between Dallas and Houston. Uh, it does not appear that there is, will be a concentrated support for that this session. It appears the leadership is not actively supporting anything at this point, so we'll see if anything comes out on um, high-speed rail from this session. That's all I have. Thank, thank you very much. Item B is Woven Health Clinic. Councilmember Mark Hill. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. Um, Woven Health signed an ARPA agreement with the City of Capel. Uh, which was effective January 1st, uh, 2023. Um, <clears throat> it provides much needed funding to the clinic. Uh, Woven is also planning to implement um, a Coppell um, pop-up clinics in the future. Uh, some possible locations would be you know, like at the YMCA or churches, uh, Coppell ISD schools, uh, or the core. And uh, discussions are underway uh, with these uh, various groups. And uh, so look forward to uh, for more information on that. And uh, just an FYI from Woven, uh, any adult resident may be seen at either the Farmer's Branch or Carrollton Clinic at no charge. And Woven is working with the uh, City of Coppell's Public Information Office to get this uh, uh, information out to Coppell residents as well. And that's it. Thank you very much. Item C is a report on MetroCrest services from Mayor Pro Tem Bijou Matthew. Thank you, Mayor. The MetroCrest Metro service to Coppell residents for the period of October 1st, 2022 to January 31st, 2023. 353 Coppell residents visited the food pantry 476 times. 92 hot meals were delivered to the seniors. 51 Coppell residents utilized the Workforce Development Service. 102 Coppell residents received emergency rent and utility assistance totaling $68,755. The Metrocus new home, the construction is hopefully will be completed by end of May 2023. They're having some delays. Uh, due to the supply chain issues and weather, um, Metrocus has to vacate the current office on 5-31-23, so it will be a
tight schedule for them. And the Metrocus service will release its Metrocus 2030 strategic plan at the March 28th keyholder breakfast. And that's all I have, Mark. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Item D is report on the Historical Society. Councilmember Cliff Long. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> As you know, this is a very uh, uh, lethargic uh, committee, uh, normally, uh, but uh, <clears throat> they have a, 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 they have a, uh, it's installed a new president, and uh, she is uh, kind of, uh, you know, got it in second gear now, as far as what the, as what the, the society is doing. Um, uh, it, the last meeting was on uh, <clears throat> was on January the 14th, uh, and uh, our guest speaker was uh, Dan Fry. Uh, some of you may know Dan as the president of the Citizens on Patrol alumni. And uh, so what Dan suggested, and basically his daughter suggested to Dan, is that uh, they uh, pony up with the Historical Society uh, in a um, attempt to uh, broaden the uh, uh, the knowledge of what uh, Dan's doing uh, in his operation and what the uh, uh, Historical Society is doing. Uh, and they're going to go together on a uh, uh, web page uh, so that uh, it'll be on uh, on there on the society's uh, web page as to what's going on between the two. Uh, the uh, uh, let's see. Uh, in addition to that, uh, uh, there's been a suggestion that we consider uh, uh, adding genealogy uh, to the uh, to the uh, society, and so it looks like that might come about. There's a, ge a genealogy group that meets uh, at the library here now, and so um, we are thinking about, uh, as a matter of fact, we're going to add that to some of the things that the, uh, that the society is doing. Um, committee has been formed. Um, uh, events. Uh, we're going to be, uh, the society is going to be, and I don't know in how, uh, uh, in uh, the uh, 4th of July parade. Uh, so uh, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, we, are, uh, we are spiffing up uh, some of the uh, properties uh, in Heritage Park, uh, beginning with the Enfeld House, and that it will be, uh, uh, it will be painted. Uh, and uh, it will also uh, require some carpenter work and those kinds of things. Uh, so that's going to be done. We had, a, we had the I-LEAD group from the, the school, which are juniors uh, at, uh, at uh, Coppell High, uh, visit, the, uh, visit the, the park. Uh, we, uh, we gave them a tour, and, uh, and uh, as a result of that, we picked up a... Uh, uh, student uh, as a volunteer, and uh, so she starts uh, this weekend uh, with her activities. Um, also, uh, we've got a uh, student who is uh, uh, middle school uh, who is going to help us with our Easter uh, activities in that uh, the, uh, the society is going to uh, be involved with uh, Easter activities. They've gotten the uh, trailer, uh, block and roll, yeah, block and roll uh, uh, for April the 1st, and so they will be there. We'll have an Easter, Easter Bunny. This is for the kids, obviously. Uh, and uh, and uh, the uh, uh, the name, the name of the of the Easter Bunny, uh, interestingly enough, it's already been named, is Hop into Spring. That's the name. This is a student. This is a middle school student uh, who had been very quiet. She had attended, uh, attended several uh, meetings, had been very quiet. Really, I never heard her say a word, and uh, she volunteered to be the Easter Bunny. So I think that's uh, that's really exciting. So we're, what we're doing 
uh, as you can see, is since uh, we've got some folks aging out of the society, we're getting some younger people in there so that uh, hopefully, you know, we won't, uh, uh, we won't uh, lose our um, uh, number of uh, members. Uh, we've also are in the process, we'll be in the process, we've got uh, a number of files from the, uh, uh, from the society that are stored in, uh, behind locked doors uh, in locked file cabinets uh, at, the, uh, uh, at the library. And so, uh, lo and behold, we thought it might be a good idea to uh, allow people to go in and do research in these uh, in these files because there's you know m m many many uh, documents in there, pictures, uh, some that that none of us have seen, uh, and so we've got a project uh, doing that. Uh, we're going to be at the uh, Elton John's. Uh, uh, at the, on the square on uh, J on uh, March the 24th. Uh, I don't know what we're going to be doing, but it's going to be. <laughs> but but it's probably probably uh, passing out information about the society and possibly uh, the upcoming museum. Uh, so um, uh, that's that that's that takes place, like I said, on March the 24th, uh, and that ends my report, brief report <laughs> uh, uh, on the society. We all appreciate you consolidating the five pages of single-spaced typing down to your report there. So thank you very hey. much. The president said I had to say all of this, so <laughs> I'm sorry. And by the way, uh, the council member to my right was really offended that the Easter Bunny is not eligible to be attended by uh, uh, some of his age group as well. Still, why are you excluding us to the Easter Bunny? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Council I didn't Member think I, I didn't think we, 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 that that would be an issue, but uh, I apologize. <laughs> All right, item number 12 is public service announcements concerning items of community interest with no council action or deliberation permitted. I do have one. I had the honor and privilege of attending the swearing in of our newest police officer today. Uh, officer Joseph Sutton took the oath of office from Police Chief Danny Barton, and it was uh, well attended by his family of two, his wife and baby daughter, uh, aged one. And uh, he is very excited about being with us, and we're excited to have him. Uh, so if you have a chance to meet uh, Officer Sutton, uh, please ex extend all the courtesies of the city of Coppell because he will be doing the same to you. Any other public service announcements? Seeing none, item number 13, there was no action necessary from the executive session. So there being no further business before this council, we are adjourned at 8.14 p.m. <laughs>